everyone, this is Mary over here at Images on the Page, and today I'm going to be doing a review for A Close and Common Orbit by Becky Chambers. So I read, well I listened to A Close and Common Orbit, and it does follow the events of what happens in A Long Way to a Small and Angry Planet, but so it follows specifically Lovelace, or as she later becomes known in the series Sidra, um, as she leaves the Wayfarer and starts to kind of make a life for herself on Port Coriol. She does it with the help of Pepper and Blue. It also, so it follows Sidra's storyline and a little girl named Jane 23. And it's kind of like alternating storylines. So one chapter will be Sidra and then one chapter will be Jane. My favorite audiobooks I've ever listened to. I am actually giving this book a 6 out of 5 because I can and just because it... Some of it is talked about in the book just touched me in such a deep way that I just kind of felt it was like the perfect time for me to read. It was like one of those at the right moment type of readings. But uh, everything else was awesome. So Becky Chambers' writing is very, is highlighted awesomely in this book because for both Sidra and Jane, they are thrust into these situations that they have no experience, no knowledge of how to deal with them. And in Jane's case, since she came from a factory, some of these things aren't even in her vocabulary. And Becky Chambers does this has this fantastic way of using someone's exceedingly limited vocabulary to describe things and make you feel what they're feeling, even if they don't have the words for it. So like when you're reading Jane's section, she uses the word good and bad a lot, but the way it's written the words surrounding it just impacted it so greatly and it was so kind of cool to see how you can take a simple word like good or bad and then make it have such be so full of meaning and depth and feeling and so that was really awesome and she did it for both Sidra and Jane and that was another thing because um, Sidra or Lovelace since she was the IA on The Wayfarer and Jane was, and Jane is a kind of enhanced human, I think is what they call them in the book. Um, so they're genetically enhanced. And so neither of them are considered alive or people. And it was just like this really interesting take on what kind of makes someone human or a being or worthy of citizenship and being defended. And that was just, I mean, it, it's, it goes through the whole book and that was just, it was a very intense subject for her to kind of delve into and to bring in these questions up about and she doesn't like in any way answer but she does definitely present these situations and being like well what makes something human and since we're dealing with aliens that's why i keep putting the human quotation marks up because obviously some aliens are not human they are their own species or race but like what makes someone worthy of having their own rights and that's that was just a really fascinating thing to see within the book. So another really thing that I thought worked really well was how she approached anxiety in possibly PTSD, but mostly anxiety because both Jane and Sidra, like I said, are thrust into these situations they have no experience for, no way, no cues within their mind to know how to go about interacting even with people or speaking and doing all these other things that they've just kind of been programmed to do. And I have one, like I have a, well I have a few, but I have one example that I want to kind of share because I thought it was just, it's like, it, it's so perfect and when I actually heard it, it made me start to tear up because it just, it hits so close to home and explains it away without using the clinical terms of anxiety and depression and stuff like that. So this is from one of the Jane chapters and it's kind of early on in the book. Um, so the first, this is Jane's part, it's partly Jane speaking in the uh, IA who lives on the ship that she now lives in. So Jane, what am I supposed to do now? Owl, the IA she lives with. I don't understand the question. What do you mean? Jane, I mean today. I was going to finish cleaning the scrap off the hall. That was my task. Can I do it in the rain? Owl, no. Jane, but Jane started feeling wrong. I don't have another task. She needed a task. Without a task, her thoughts went places she didn't want them to go. She didn't want another bad behavior day. She wanted to be okay today. She wanted to be okay, and if she didn't have a task, and it's just, it kind of shows how cyclical those thoughts can get. 
your anxiety. Like, it's just, it revolves in how, well, like, she explains it as a bad behavior day. Because when she was in the factory, if they acted out, they were bad behaviors. And it's just, I thought it resonated so well. And she dealt with those issues so well without ever, like, coming out. Without using typical terms for them or anything like that. Because it is from Jane or Sidra's perspective. And since we're seeing it from them, their perspective, it is a very in-depth and intense way to look at anxiety. Like I said, I suffer from anxiety, and so this really resonated deep. It really made a lot of sense to me. It is kind of how I can feel on my bad days, and how you just want it to be okay. You just want to be okay. And it's not any choice of your own if you're not doing okay. And it hit me very hard when I read that. And it also... Becky Chambers, her first book, The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet, had significant diversity so much in her books, and then this one doesn't have any less. And they go a little bit more in-depth because The Long Way is kind of told from multiple perspectives, like from the whole crew, where this is just kind of focused on the two different characters. And so another thing that she does really well is she deals with characters outside of the binary. So Sidra, in and of herself, um, she's in a female body, but because she's an IA, she doesn't really seem to care about that. Um, and then there's another character, Tak, um, who's an Aeluan, um, is a species on Port Coriol, and they're, they actually switch from male to female genders. It is a part of their species to do that. And it was explained so well, like, that is just, well, for the Aeluans, it isn't kind of how they felt, it was more how, like, th their body decided, like, and it was on a specific time, but it definitely dealt with gender fluidity and how she even changed the pronoun. So like when Tak was female, Becky Chambers used used she, her, hers. And when Tak was male, he, him, his. And that was definitely really cool. Um, she also did kind of like a dealing with, I don't know if body dysphoria is the quite right word, but not feeling comfortable in your own skin. And I identify kind of as agendered. And so like there are days where I don't feel like my skin sits right. I know it's kind of hard to explain, but it's kind of like if your pants are twisted a little or your shirt's bunched up or like your bra strap's twisted. And it's just like this constant feeling of uncomfortableness and not quite sitting right. And Sidra, who is now, or Lovelace, who is now Sidra and forced into this body, feels the same way. There's She spends a whole lot of time dealing with not feeling like this is her body and like and how it's all wrong and that also definitely resonated deeply for me just because there are days that I feel like that and I feel like other people could connect with that as well. I think this book was done so well. I feel like when Becky Chambers decided to hone on more on the two characters instead of doing multiple characters I feel like it really gave her writing style and her character development a chance to shine and really just dig deep and become so enriched and I would recommend this book to everyone and anyone and you don't if the first one doesn't really seem that interesting to you you don't necessarily have to read it um it does follow like I said the events of the first book but they they go from the Wayfarer to Port Coriol and we don't really see the characters from the Wayfarer or a lot of the stuff that happened on the long way in the long way book doesn't really correspond too much with what is happening in the second book. So there is that opportunity if the synopsis for the second one just sounds better. I would highly recommend reading both just because they're both awesome. They do have two different like, tones to them. The Long Way is definitely a bit more fluffy and kind of like misfit family getting together type of thing which is awesome and I absolutely loved it. This is a bit more serious. Um, there's, there's definitely it's funny moments and fluffy moments since it deals with two two people who don't feel like they fit in their own body and don't or have to need to deal with a world that they don't know, it is a bit more serious at times. The one thing I do have to kind of preface is there was one thing that I didn't, I don't know if not enjoy is the right word, but the ending was very confusing to me. There was like a prologue part and I didn't quite understand what was going on and maybe that was because I was listening to it and I'd go better. It would go better if I went back and read it. So if I reread it, I will let you know. But until the next video, ta-ta for now.